Okay, next. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the broadcast, the third session of uh, budgeting and budgetary control. Uh, we're looking at the preparation of the functional budget, the uh, budget preparation. In this lecture, it's critical for students writing uh, management accounting in ACCA, in SEMA, in uh, ICAG, uh, in ICAN, and uh, other management accounting uh, qualification programs. It's also valid for students uh, preparing for other advanced courses like strategic case study uh, and business uh, uh, reporting and other uh, issues where the role of the management accountant is going to be critical so in case you missed the first session uh, we're going to be putting the link of that in this uh, video and then the second session which we did yesterday to look at the various uh, forms and types of uh, functional budgets that we prepared and we're going to be building on that today to continue with our discussion on budgeting and budgetary uh, control in relation to that and most importantly we're going to also be practicing some questions in relation to that so if you join the broadcast and you have some questions you know what to do you comment below in the chat box any questions you have you want me to cover you want me to share my thoughts on you want me to assist you to answer you can comment below with your questions in relation to that then remember to also give us a thumbs up on this video and share it as well with your friends your colleagues on Facebook on WhatsApp as well so that we will be able to reach as much people as possible who are preparing for the examination in relation to that so if you join the broadcast comment below in any uh, for the questions that you have so that I can answer the questions for you as I continue with our discussion on budgeting and budgetary control so yesterday I introduced you to the general procedure for the preparation of the budget right we look at the general procedure for the preparation of the budgets now when we look at the general procedure for the preparation of the budget among other things we consider the issue in relation to the budget committee so we said that the budget committee meets and when the budget committee means among other things we said the budget committee does three major things i believe you remember we said one the budget committee sets the strategic objective of the organization number two the budget committee uh determines means the basic assumptions that must be used in the preparation of the budget like inflation rate exchange rate discounting factor uh, minimum wage legislation all of those things are said by the budget uh, committee and then third thing is about documentation where the budget committee decides the content that must be included in the various types of budgets the structure that the budget has to be formed in relation to that so that was the first stage we discussed yesterday about the general procedure for the preparation of the budget then we came to the second stage that is the principal budget factor so we said that the principal budget factor is the bottleneck or the limiting factor around which the budget is going to be prepared the principal budget factor is the central idea around which the budget of the organization is going to be prepared in relation to that and i gave i made mention of the fact that when it comes to for profit making organization their principal budget factor is different from not for profit making organization so you've got to be careful in relation to how you're going to be looking at that in relation to that then also the issue in relation to uh, for profit making organizations we mentioned that if it comes to for profit making organization the pr principal budget factor can be issues such as um, material availability labor hours available um, machine capacity of the organization and then the demand condition and when it comes to the not for profit making organization the bottleneck process can be it is usually funding then i quelled it down or i boiled it down to say that for profit making organization organization for the purpose of our discussion for the purpose of the budget that we're going to be preparing we said that the basic uh principal budget factor is the demand condition so if you remember clearly we mentioned that the budget of the prof for profit making organizations is going to be prepared based on the sales uh, demand that a company expects to have uh, in the uh, budgeted period for the organization some more question i see your statement i'm going to reply to that in a moment then uh, from the principal budget factor we came to the third step where we mentioned about the issues about the preparation of the sales budget so we said the sales budget is a budget that is prepared by the selling and distribution department showing the output for each of the product to be sold as well as the revenue to be derived so the sales budget is showed in units as well as in value in relation to that then we said 
after the sales budget is prepared all the other functional budgets are prepared then someone asks why do we call it functional budget then i explain that we call it a functional or functional budgets because these are budgets representing various functions various departments of various segments of the organization that enables the organization to carry out its work and i mentioned that the sales budget is also a functional budget but that is a starting point for the preparation of the budget so once we prepare the sales budget we looked at the production uh, budget from there we came to the material usage uh, budget then we came to the material purchases budget and then we concluded yesterday in that video on the material okay so the material purchases budget we divided it into two the material purchases budget in kilograms or in liters whatever unit of measurement we are using in the question and then the material purchases budget in value that is the currency or the cost of that material in relation to that so these are the things that we discussed in the part two that is the yesterday video on the preparation of the functional budget and in the part one we spoke about the flex budget uh, and how we can prepare the flex budget in relation to that so I see a question from Samuel Quaisin. Let me answer that uh, real quick in relation to that. So Samuel Quaisin has a question. He says, please, could you explain comparability com comparability in relation to uh, transfer pricing? Comparability in relation and comparability it various methods. Then he said comparability in relation to transfer pricing. Uh, Samuel, I don't get the question too well. Uh, maybe you can reclassify, uh, restate it for me so I get the understanding better. I don't understand comparability in relation to transfer pricing or comparability its methods. I don't get it well. So if you can re-put it in a one-liner for me so I can uh, better understand uh, that very, very well in relation to that. So once we prepare all these uh, budgets, the next one we got to prepare is to now say that, okay, now we've looked at the materials we need for the production output to be produced. Remember, in the production budget, we took into consideration defective outputs, all right? In the production budget, we took into consideration defective outputs. Give me a moment. Let me see this. Okay, so we took into consideration defective outputs. Then when it came to the material usage budget, we also considered the issue about uh, normal losses or normal wastages in relation to that. So let's get into the discussion deeper and let's look at how we prepare the labor budget. So the next functional budget we prepare is the labor budget. the labor budget now like the name suggests and like you you should know already the labor budget is simply the budget showing the labor hours required for the production units to be produced and the cost of that labor so the labor budget is divided into the number of hours we require for the production of the uh, units of products and as well as uh, the cost of that labor in relation to that now please note that when it comes to the issue about uh, the labor budget we're going to first get the labor hours required and then we have to get the labor cost required now or the labor cost to be incurred now when it comes to the labor hours required one of the key things we have to take into consideration one of the key things very very important that we have to always always take into consideration is the thing in relation to um uh, uh ideal time as well as uh labor labor efficiency now what happens is that when there is ideal time uh, it means that the labor hours required is going to be more because definitely there is going to be some ideal time that we need to look out for in relation to that so the, if there is ideal time in the question it has to be built into the labor hours required 
Another thing is that sometimes there is not going to be ideal time. Rather, there is going to be what is referred to as there is going to be what is referred to as um, labor efficiency, meaning that the labor force that we are using are very efficient or the labor force we are using are efficient now if the labor force we are using are efficient that means that we are going to be requiring less hours than we needed in order to produce the product so when we are dealing with the labor hours required and dealing with the labor hours required we must take into consideration the issue about ideal time and then efficiency of labor now when we are dealing with the labor cost one of the things that we have to also consider is that after looking at the labor hours required there could be built into the system what is called the guaranteed labor hours now if you remember from your studies from accounting for labor you remember that when it comes to uh, payments to labor, there are a couple of methods we can talk about. We have the uh, time rate system, we have the peace rate system. Now, those people that we pay uh, with the time rate system, because uh, there is there is going to be some limitations and to enable them to still get the money or the uh, employees to still get the money, the company can guarantee a certain minimum hours that they could be using to pay them. So if we are calculating the labor uh, rate or the labor cost uh, budget, we have to factor and take into consideration any guarantee minimum uh, hours. And we're going to be looking at all of these in relation to that. But I want you to be uh, uh, abreast with all of these principles in relation to that so let's look at the first one the labor hours budget okay the labor hours budget so like I mentioned the labor hours budget is simply going to be showing how many labor hours is required to meet the production units to meet the sales demand okay so if we want to produce 10,000 units how many labor hours do we require or do we need but remember I told you that in determination of the labor hours required, we may have to take into consideration ideal time or efficiency of labor. Where there is ideal time, it is going to increase the labor hours we need. When the labor is efficiency, then it is going to reduce the labor hours that we need in relation to that. So let's crunch it out and see what we do. So in the preparation of the labor uh, hours budget, we're going to be bringing the production units. That is the units to produce to meet the uh, sales demand. So you go to the production budget. The last figure there, we're going to be picking that. So the production units. Then we bring the labor hour per unit. The labor hours per unit. And that's going to be in hours. Once we bring that up, we're going to be multiplying it. And then we get the labor hours required. Now, this is labor hours required, the first level. If in the question we don't have anything like idle time, we don't have anything like efficiency of labor, then it ends there. Then it ends there. But there are times when these two guys, one of them can be present in the question. That is, the issue in relation to ideal time or labor is very efficient. Let's look at the first scenario. If labor or if there is ideal time. If there is ideal time, it means that it is going to increase the labor hours required. So the examiner could say that 5% uh, of labor hours are used as, as break or 5% of labor hours are accounted for as ideal time. It means you are still paying labor, you are still giving them money, there is work they can do, but they are not going to be doing anything there. So we have to build it into the system. So we're going to be adding any ideal time available and then boom we now get the labor hours required to meet production units remember i told you that the namings of these things uh is discretional okay labor hours required to meet production units so what do we mean here like we did in the production budget, defective outputs, and we did in the material usage budget, normal loss, when it comes to dealing with the idle time, it's still the same concept, it's still the same principle. Like so for the scenario I gave earlier, let's say for instance, 8% of labor hours 
are ideal time or eight percent of labor hours will not be used for anything that means that is an ideal time for that reason if it is eight percent that means the figure we will get here represents 92 percent so if we now want the ideal time it's going to be eight percent over 92 so eight over 92 times this particular figure here in relation to that so that is how we will get our ideal time figure i believe you get a concept very well that is how we get the ideal time figure like i said it depends on the question if there is no ideal time we end here but if there is ideal time then the ideal time will increase the labor hours we need in order to make sales available because if all you have is hundred thousand hours okay if you can get hundred thousand hours and each product uses two hours uh and we are producing uh that means we can produce 250,000 units, I guess. Okay? 50,000 units. If, for instance, part of this 100,000 hours, 8% is going to be ideal time, that means we cannot produce the 50,000 units. So in order for us to produce the 50,000 units, what do we have to do? We must increase the labor hours that we can obtain. And so that means that the labor hours required will be more than what? 100,000 in relation to that. So that is the concept about dealing with the ideal time but the second scenario about dealing with the labor hour budget is the issue about the uh, efficiency of labor there are times when labor is not lazy they are gonna they are not gonna be there to to not do anything labor is efficient they don't need time to rest they have they can work uh, uh continuously so if there is efficiency of labor that means that means that the labor hours required will be less that means the labor hours required will be less so let me explain that concept to you with a scenario so you can put it down and let me jump and put a scenario here very simple scenario here so production units let's say that's 50,000 uh, labor hours require let's say three hours per unit let's say idle time is eight percent then in another scenario labor efficiency so efficiency of labor is one two five percent so this is the scenario that we have i believe you finish uh writing down this and let me just put in that in relation to that so this is the short scenario that we have number one i think i see a question let me answer that real quick augustine a boatin ejenim uh from new york all right augustine you're welcome i think it's been a while since i heard from you on the broadcast augustine um, and then some more questions. Please, determination of comparability and the transfer pricing method. Determination of comparability and the transfer pricing method. Okay, I will. I will. I will have to cross check that. Uh, I really don't uh, get a concept that you are uh, talking about comparability and the transfer pricing uh, method. So production unit is uh, 50,000. Labor hours require is three hours per unit. Idle time 8%, that is scenario A. And scenario B, labor efficiency C is one to five percent The requirement is to calculate the labor hour required to meet the production units, okay? The labor hours required to meet the production unit. So how do we go about that? Very simple. So it is the labor hour budget that we are preparing. So how do we go about it? We bring our production unit as usual. And that's $50,000. Sorry, 50,000 units. And then we bring the labor hour per unit. And that's three hours. 
So we multiply it up, and that is, so we are doing the A aspect if there is ideal time. So we multiply that up, and that is 150,000 hours. So that's the labor hour required to meet it. But since there is an ideal time, we got to build it into the system. So we add ideal time. Now remember we are told ideal time is 8%. If ideal time is 8%, that means this 150,000 represents 92%. So it's going to be 8 over 92 times 150,000. So let's do the calculation. Let me grab my Casio. I'll get my Casio calculator. Let me do that here. Um, okay. So we're going to have 8 divided by 92 times 150,000. And that's 13,044. Approximately 13,044. And so now. The labor hours required for production unit. For the production unit, it's going to be 113, right? So 163 and 44. 163 and 44 hours. So that is the answer to the question in relation to that so that is how we get the labor hours so you can see that if there is ideal time the labor hours has shot up in relation to that so that's the first scenario if there is idle time the second scenario is if the labor efficiency is now the labor efficiency here is 125 percent now remember what i said if labor is efficient it means that the hours we require will be less than the hours that we should have spent so how do we go about that so i'm going to be underlining this like this so we're just going to work with the labor hours there okay so the labor hours of 150,000. so this is the labor hours we need 150,000. but because labor is efficient that means we will require less hours than that so labor are required Taking into consideration efficiency, it's going to be 100 over 125 times 150,000. Okay, 100 over 125 times 150,000. 100 over 125 times 50,000. Hey, 150,000. So that means we need 120,000 hours. I hope you get a principle. So this is how we calculate the labor hours required, taking into consideration the uh, issue in relation to ideal time. So you can see that with ideal time, the hours is shooting up to 168,044. But where labor is efficient, then it is reduced to only wider than 20,000 hours. So whatever rate of efficiency the examiner gives us, it will be more than 100%, okay? It's because they are not efficient. If they are not efficient, that is where the ideal time issue has to come in, meaning we need more hours in relation to that. So if it says 135, we'll do 100 over 135, multiply it by the labor hours required, then we'll now get the labor hours we will need for this job taking into consideration the efficiency of labor in relation to that. So that is how we deal with the labor hours budget. I hope you get it. So make sure you understand this carefully, the idle time and then the efficiency. So you can put it down and let's continue real quick. I see another comment from, I think, Augustine. He said, yes, the coronavirus pandemic has kept me in a scary moment. Honestly, I haven't been 
able to concentrate. I pray for everyone in Ghana, though. Yeah, definitely. Uh, New York has become the epicenter of the coronavirus, uh, not just in the USA, but across the world. Even uh, more cases, even close to Wuhan. And so I, I understand your plea. But make sure that you stay safe. We are all praying that um, this pandemic will pass away gradually. So make sure you stay safe, you stay home, and then uh, take care of yourself. Because New York is getting scary day by day. But we will get through this, all right? We will get through this. So um, you don't, you don't, uh, it, it's a hard moment. But the recommendation I will give you is this. Don't look at it from just the cases happening, the news, and what Andrew Como, your governor, uh, is doing. Uh, in relate not your governor but the mayor your mayor is doing in relation to that but look at it from the positive aspect what can you do for yourself now that you are on on quarantine you are home what can you do how can you improve your life better so don't look at it from the negative aspect it's hard not to to turn a blind eye on the situation but this is the time that you need to also focus on yourself delve deeper into yourself and find out how you can take your life to the next level some people are using this period to learn new skills do something better uh, and and great for their life so once in a while you think about it but do something positive for yourself and take your life to the next level in relation to that so that is the recommendation i will offer you on on that but we pray that we will all uh, go through this uh, successfully and not be hurt so let's move on with the discussion now that we've get we've calculated the labor hours budget the second thing we have to look at is what is the cost of this so that takes us to the labor cost budget. Now, the labor cost budget is simple. Once we get the labor hours required, we multiply it by the rate per hour. So assuming in this question we were giving rates per hour, we were giving rates per hour to be, say, um, $3.5 dollars. Then we will just use the $3.5 dollars to multiply this 163044 then that will give us the labor cost, how much we're going to be incurring in terms of labor cost. Or if it is about the efficiency, we multiply the 3.5 by the 120,000 hours to get the labor cost in relation to that. So that is how we deal with the labor cost. But remember I told you that when it comes to the labor cost budget, one thing that you have to also take into consideration is the issue about the guaranteed labor hours. We're going to be looking at a question in a moment where I'll be illustrating to you how the guaranteed labor hours is used. But this is what it means. If, for instance, during a period, so let's say that labor is guaranteed, okay? So guaranteed labor hours, it's say uh, 150,000 hours. Okay, so during every month, a minimum hours available that employees will be paid, will be using to pay them is 150,000 hours. So if in a month they work below the 150,000 hours, we will still be paying them the 150,000 hours. It's, it's, it's a way to motivate them to still work for the company irrespective of the condition that we have in. But if in a certain month they work more than the 150,000 hours, then we will use the hours they work for to pay them. I hope you are getting the idea. So the guaranteed minimum uh, hours or the guaranteed labor hours comes in when we are determining the we are, when we are determining the labor cost budget so whatever it's given to us in the question we compare it with the labor required budget if the guarantee is more than the labor required we use the guarantee to pay labor if the guarantee is less than the hours required we use the hours required to pay labor in relation to that so that is what you have to understand when we talk about the preparation of the labor budget so what have we looked at so far cumulatively We've looked at the preparation of the flex budget. We've looked at the preparation of the uh, uh, functional budget, the sales budget, the production budget, the material usage budget, the material uh, purchases budget, the material cost budget. We've looked at the labor hours uh, budget and we've looked at the labor cost budget in relation to that. 
So after we prepare the labor budgets, the next one is to look at the overhead budget, factory overheads. Now, usually when it comes to factory overheads, you like you know already, we uh, it, it will be stated straight in, or straight up or directly in the question. So we don't really have to do any workings when it comes to the overheads budget because the examiner can say variable uh, production overhead is fifty dollars per unit produced. So whatever that is, we will take the fifty dollars and multiply it by the unit to be produced from our production budget, and that will give us the variable production overhead. Uh, uh, budget and then the fixed production overheads also will be stated clearly in the question then uh maybe uh variable selling and distribution overheads variable administration overheads fixed selling and distribution overheads fixed administration overheads so all those things will be simply stated in the question especially when we are preparing the cash budget or when we are preparing the master budget that is the budgeted income statement and the budgeted statement of financial position then that will not be a serious issue for us because at the end of the day at the end of the day we will just look at the directly stated information in the question and pick it up like that to be able to answer the question in relation to that so that is how we go about that so when the budget committee meets we determine the principal budget factor after that what do we do we prepare the sales budget and we prepare all the other functional budgets so once the functional budget is prepared we now put the results together into what is referred to as the cash budget okay into what is referred to as the cash budget so let's move on to the next uh budget preparation and that is going to be the cash budget Now, the cash budget, like the name suggests, is a budget prepared showing all cash inflows and cash outflow within the budget period under consideration. Please note that because we are preparing the cash budget, all non-cash items are not included in the preparation of the cash budget. It means when you are preparing the cash budget, items such as depreciation is not brought, items such as uh, provision for bad debt is not brought, items such as absorption of overheads it's not brought because sorry because these are non-cash items so in the cash budget all non-cash items are not brought depreciation provision for bad debt uh uh pro absorption of overheads all of these things are non-cash items so we don't bring them in the cash budget however when we are preparing the budgeted income statement budgeted statement of financial position we will consider all those items because they are supposed to be brought in relation to that so get a difference very well once you are preparing the cash budget all cash items are not brought so let's look at a pro forma of the cash budget i'm not going to give too detailed uh pro forma here because we'll be looking at questions uh later on in relation to how uh the cash budget is prepared i think we even already have a question on the cash budget on the on the on the channel so we have january we have february and then march so i am assuming that we are preparing the cash budget for the first quarter of the year under consideration so we put in uh our uh, currency signs up we're working in dollars then we always look at the receipts first so we bring the receipts in relation to that now the pro forma is different in relation to uh various school of thought some school of thought actually starts with the opening uh cash balance and then they work themselves out in relation to that but I don't, I will not go through that. I will just bring the receipts, bring our payments. We get the net cash flows. Then we look at the opening balance and then we'll get a closing balance. Then boom, we will take it there in relation to that. So under the receipts, what do we bring there? Under the receipts, we bring items such as cash sales. So during the year, any cash that we make, remember you may have to do workings for that. <laughs> very, very important. So we bring it in January, in February, and then in March. So you got to be careful about that. 
then receipt from credit customers that is a regular thing that you do receipt from credit customers is a regular thing that you're going to be doing workings for in every cash budget so you bring that for each period respectively then there could be other income such as uh, disposal of assets dividend income received so any other receipts during the year maybe you will receive some loan or you go for some loan during the year all of that could be brought respectively okay so dividend income disposal of assets uh loans that will be borrowing or will be taking during the year rent income received all of that sorry could come in relation to that so we put it up and that gives us the total receipts So once we get a total receipt, we move on to the next slide, and that is going to bring the payments as well in relation to that. Now, usually what I do is I label this either as one or as A in relation to that. So that is the total receipt. Now you can put it down and let's continue because I want to clean it and uh, put the payments down because of my uh, space. I will not be able to do as much uh, thing in the bottom below. So you can put it down real quick and let's continue. We good. okay so let's look at the payment side in relation to that let's got a payment so on the payment side there are a couple of cheap uh and easy marks that you could pick up there in relation to that but one of the key things about the payment is any cash purchases that we make during the year which we may have to do workings for so cash purchases is brought then payments to trade creditors now you're going to be doing workings for that all the time payments to trade creditors because that is where the English will come in. Remember I told you yesterday that when it comes to the preparation of the budget, one of the key things that stands out is the English because the examiner is going to be making a couple of statements or a lot of statements and you've got to be in the position to be able to understand the statements that are being made. So payment to creditors. Now right after that, there are some cheap marks you have to uh, take in relation to that. Maybe production overheads. Remember, production over overheads can be divided into fixed and variable. So we bring it there. But remember, I told you about absorption of overheads and then uh, 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 depreciation. All those things will not come there. Then any other uh, expenses like uh, maybe electricity, uh, whatever, okay, could be brought there. So let me not just say electricity, let me just say other payments, okay? Or other expenditure uh, items. So like electricity, uh, rent, lease of property, okay? Salaries, wages and salaries, all of those things comes under the payments slide. So when we finish, we add it up. 
we added up and that gives us the total payment or the total expenditure i'm using this interchangeably the total payment or the total expenditure so remember from the top you already have your total receipt now at the bottom you have your total payment i'm going to number that as two respectively so when we subtract the payment from the total receipt we get a net cash balance and that could be a surplus or deficit okay it's a deficit when it is negative it's a surplus when it is positive in relation to that so we subtract all the payments from all the uh, cash receipts and that gives us the net cash balance in relation to that now once we have the net cash balance once we have the net cash balance what do we do this is where we bring the opening cash balance okay in the first year and we add it to the net balance and we get a closing cash balance let me bring uh, this down a little bit and that gives us the closing cash balance or cash balance brought forward so this closing cash balance for the January becomes the opening for February then we get a February's closing and that becomes opening for March and we get a March closing in relation to that so like I said some people bring the opening cash balance at the first when they are dealing with the receipts okay but I go with this approach because uh, this approach looks uh, more simple and more straightforward for me because once I add the opening here I get a closing the closing for one period becomes the opening there if not you will have to do this opening at the uh, up above there before you even arrive at this figure and uh, it could create a couple of uh, uh, long process for me in relation to that but if I put all of them here bringing the opening balance at the bottom here it sounds uh, it looks simple uh, for me in relation to that nonetheless either approach is correct okay either approach is correct so that is how we prepare the cash budget but when it comes to the cash budget there is something that you need to understand you see preparing of all these budgets there are a couple of rules exceptions that guides each of them for instance i told you in the production budget what do we take into consideration deficit then i told you in the labor uh, in the product uh, material usage budget what do we take into consideration normal losses then i told you the issue in relation to um um Production budget, not deficit, but defect, uh, defective output. Then the material usage budget, we take into consideration normal losses or normal wastages. Then in the labor budget, what do we take into consideration? Ideal time, labor efficiency, and then also we take into consideration the issue in relation to uh, guaranteed labor hours. When it comes to the cash budget also, there are a couple of rules we must understand, which I've already stated, that we don't bring in depreciation, we don't bring in uh, absorption of overheads we don't bring in any issues about provision for uh, bad debts any non-cash item are not brought uh, uh, it's not brought on the face of the cash budget but not only that there are times that there are uh, a couple of statements in the question that we have to be observed uh, that we have to observe and look out quick uh, most importantly for instance the examiner can say that the company for each period must keep a minimum cash balance of say thirty thousand dollars the company for each month must keep a minimum cash balance of say thirty thousand dollars so if the entity must keep a minimum cash balance of thirty thousand dollars how do we go about it what it then means is that when you get your net cash here that is the closing or the cash balance brought forward here that is the closing cash balance if it is below 30,000, then you have to put the 30,000 there and then the difference will have to be borrowed. Are you getting the principle well? It is the company's policy that it, every month they must have a minimum cash of 30,000. So if you finish and your closing is not up to 30,000, you must write 30,000 there and then the balancing figure will be borrowed 
from the bank in order to top up in short-term bank overdraft in order to cover up with that that means that in that case the first period will not be the figure you had which is less than thirty thousand, but will be the thirty thousand, and that will become the opening balance for the next period in relation to that. So when it comes to the cash budget, that is also another statement that you have to take more notes uh, of when it comes to the preparation of the cash budget in relation to that. So once we prepare the cash budget, we now go to the budgeted income statement and then the budgeted statement of financial position. The fun part is that I'm not going to be giving pro forma for these guys because I believe that uh, you know them already. Nonetheless, we will be solving a full uh, budget question and uh, we're going to be posting the question ahead of time uh, before it will be solved in relation to that. So we'll be solving a full budget question where we start from the production budget and then we'll end on the income statement uh, in, the, in the statement of financial position. That is preparation of the master budget in relation into that so that is how we prepare all these functional budgets for an organization so if you have any questions you know what to do you put them in the comment box or better still you can also connect with me on skype at premium educator or you can whatsapp our uh, WhatsApp line 050 114 9296 050 114 9296 with any questions that you have and we will be uh, able to address all your questions for you in relation to that. So that is how we prepare the cash budget. So you can put it down and let's look at some uh, questions on the functional budget. look at some three pieces of questions here one on the purchases budget one on the cash receipts schedule and one on the labor budget in relation to that so giving you some few moments to finish with the workings So if you join the broadcast and you have any question, you can put it in the chat box, all right? And uh, I'll be answering. We are looking at the preparation of budgeting. We just finished with the uh, uh, cash budget and I've given you time to write it out and then we continue. That's the payment and then the balancing figure there. Then we are coming to solve three questions on uh, the various functional budget, the purchases budget, the cash receipt schedule, and then uh, the... Uh, labor budget in relation to that. Um, I'm going to be reading the questions out and you can write it out in relation to that. But if you want a copy of the question also, you can send uh, me a message on Skype. The ID is Premium Educator. So my Skype ID is Premium Educator. Or you can WhatsApp uh, uh, WhatsApp line 050-114-9296. 050-114-9296. And we will be able to uh, send you this question on Skype. That is if you want to have the questions by yourself. But I'll be reading out as well that you can write in relation to that. So let's see what we have here. The first question is, uh, like I said, the requirement there is prepare a purchases budget of Royal Music Limited for July through to October. So we are preparing the uh, purchases budget for July, uh, September, October. All right. July, September, October, July, hey, July to September, October. <laughs> Can you imagine that? July August September and October so we are preparing for July August September and October I see a question there let me answer that real quick okay so Komba can buy now, if I don't mention your name well, please forgive me, okay? It's not intentional. So, Komba, I have been yearning to watch cash budgets. Thanks so much, my noble lecturer. Okay, it's a pleasure. All right, so uh, that is it about that in relation to that. 
all right so if you have any questions please put it in the chat box i'll be answering all your questions for you in relation to that so we're going to be looking at some uh pieces of questions on uh the preparation of the various uh functional budgets then like i said later on we are going to be picking a full budget question where we prepare from the uh sales budget to the master budget and it's going to be very detailed master class that i'll be doing as well in relation to that so make sure that if you have not subscribed to the channel you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so that if i go live like this and i'll be going live every day 4 p.m 4 30 p.m 4 p.m or 4 30 uh sometimes we 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 have that 30 minutes or uh, off or on sometime so every single day i'll be going live and We'll be able to assist you so if there are any questions you have or there are things you want me to cover you can put them in the chat box for me and say ishira i want us to cover this but whatever it is i would uh, make some time available then we can cover it in relation to that so let's go on to look at how we can prepare the purchases budget the cash receipt schedule as well as the uh, uh labor budgets So let me raise my tripod a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to read out a question. Like I said, um, you can send me a message on Skype. My Skype ID is Premium Educator to request the question. Or you can send us a message on WhatsApp 050 114 050-114-9296 and the question can be sent to you but I'm going to be reading it as well just that I'll be a little bit uh, fast so you may not be able to scribble fast but you can uh, pause the video later on and then look at it. Royal Music is a merchandising business which sells electronic keyboards. Each month the company purchases enough keyboards to meet the sales uh operations and maintain the ending inventories at 40 percent of the projected next month sales now remember one thing i told you i told you that when it comes to the issue about budgeting you have to be able to read the english very well we are not doing grammar here but you should be able to read the english very well because if you take uh, the english for granted you will be punished so look at the language here it says each month the company purchases enough keyboards each month the company purchases enough keyboards to meet sales operations and maintain the ending inventory at 40 percent of the projected next month sales and maintain the ending inventory at 40 percent of the next month sales now if the examiner says the ending inventory at 40 percent of the projected next month sales it simply means that the closing inventory for each month is 40 percent of next month sales I hope you are getting the concept. So the closing inventory for each month is 40% of the following month sales. The average cost of a keyboard is 500 uh, Ghana cities. The firm is expected to follow this policy on July 1. The firm is expected to follow this policy on July 1. The budgeted sales from July to November are as follows. So remember the requirement of this question is to prepare the purchases budget of Royal Music Limited for July through to November. So July, August, September, sorry, from July through to October, July, August, September, and then October. So before we can prepare the purchases budget, if you remember the purchases budget carefully, we bring our sales, we will less opening stock, add closing stock and then we will get the purchases uh budget or the purchase the units to be purchased in relation to that so let's look at how we go now the budgeted sales given for july to november are respectively 800 900 1800 from july to november 800 900 thousand to thousand and 800 respectively in relation to that so based on that royal music limited and uh so let me divide my board so that i can efficiently use it in relation to that i see some comments i'm going to be replying to them shortly 
So I've divided my board into two. Let's see what we have in relation to that. So the first working we do is the closing stock. Okay, because the, we are told that the closing stock is 40% of next month sales. So the first thing we do all the time is the closing stock. So let's get a closing stock. So to get a closing stock, we will bring the sales. So July, August, September, October, and November. So we are giving the sales for this period respectively. 800, 900. 1,000 to 1,000 and So these are the budgeted sales. But we are looking for the closing stock. So the closing stock is 40% of next month's sales. So if you want a closing stock for July, it's going to be 40% of the 900. So now let me open my calculator 0.4 of 900. And that's 360. 40% of this. 0.4 of 1,002. That's 480. 0.4 of 1,000. That's 400. 0.4 of 800. That's 320. All right? So that is the closing stock. That's the closing stock. Now, once we have the closing stock, we can now prepare the purchases budget as the examiner has ordered us or has asked us to do. So we bring July, August, September, up to October. So what do we bring first? We bring the issue in relation to the sales. So the sales respectively are 800. I see some questions. I'll be replying to them in a moment. 900. 1,002 and then 800, all right? So we bring the sales. Then after the sales, we add the closing stock. We add closing stock. So if you check the closing stock for July is 360, closing stock for August 480, closing stock for September 400, closing stock for October 320, right? So once we get a closing stock, add up to them. This is going to be 1160, 121380, 1600, and then 1120. Then we will less the opening stock. Okay, so we less the opening stock. Now, um, the examiner is saying that, the examiner is saying that uh the organization so let's look at it it says each month the company purchases enough uh keyboards to meet sales operations and maintains the ending inventory at 40 percent of the projected next month sales the average cost of a keyboard is 500 the firm is expected to follow this policy on july uh one in relation to that so we bring the opening stock now in the opening stock the closing stock for July will become opening for August. So the 360 will be here. We're going to less that. Op closing stock for August will become opening for this 480. Closing stock for September become opening for October 400. So the question is, what will be the opening stock for July? Now, from, from the scenario in the question carefully, two things are there that you must identify in relation to that. We are told that each month, the company purchases enough uh, keyboards to meet sales operations and maintains the ending uh, inventory at 40% of the projected next month sales. And we are told that the average uh, cost of a keyboard is 500 Ghana cities. The firm is expected to follow this policy on July 1. Now, since the firm is expected to follow the policy that they have uh, put out on July 1, what we would then conclude is that for July 1, there would not be any opening stock in relation to that. But another school of thought can also say that uh, in June, 
that means the closing stock for June will be like 40% of this in relation to that 320. So another school of thought can also uh, say that. But since they say that the policy, that is this policy about the company is from July 1 or is to be, uh, the company is expected to follow it from July 1. It means there will not be any opening stock here in relation to that. So this will be the purchases in unit. So this will be the purchases budget in units. So 1160 here. And then let's see what we got here. Oh, I've closed my calculator. Let me open it up. So 1380 minus 360. And that'll be 1020. And then we're gonna also have 1600 minus 480 and that's 1120 then we'll have 400 from this and that'll be 8 7 two, zero, in relation to that am i right yep 7 two, zero, in relation to that so now that we have the purchases like that we bring the cost per unit And we are using Ghana cities here. The cost per unit we are told is 500 Ghana. So we bring the 500 here. 500, 500, 500. So we multiply that respectively. So if we are multiplying respectively, what do we do? I think I have the last one there. So 1120 times 500. And that will be 560,000 here. And then I have 720 times 500. That will be 360,000. Then I have 1020 times 500. That will be 510,000. And then 1160 times 500,000. That will be 580000 So this is the purchases budget in units and purchases budget in value. So that is the answer to the question. Remember, we prepare, we calculated the closing stock first, and then we bring it there in relation to that. So you can put it down and let's continue. Let me look at some questions that I, I'm seeing on the, in the chat box. Okay, let's see. Kamba said, please send me the website where I can get this text from. I believe the question must have been taken from one of the ACCA texts for management accounting. You can send uh, Kamba, you can send us a message on Skype. My Skype ID is Premium Educator. That's my Skype ID. Or you can send us a WhatsApp message plus 2335 uh, Five zero one one four nine two nine six plus two three three five zero one one four nine two nine six. Augustine A. Boatin said, Please throw a bit more light on them. If not today, maybe next class. Augustine Boatin, I should throw more light on which one to be specific. Then Uche Ijehu said, Hi, Inshira. I'm still waiting for the Fijera the Moon module. Oh, okay. So we will be making that available uh, in relation to that. Augustine Boatin, if you can clarify, if you are online and you can clarify your question, you said, please throw a bit more light on them. If not today, maybe next class. What are you referring to? Are you referring to the um, the budget, the income budgeted income statement or budgeted statement of financial position? Is that what you are talking about? So maybe you can clarify for me in relation to that so I can better answer your questions for you so that is the a aspect of the question i believe you are done with it in relation to that now the next question Okay, I think I see a clarification from what 
what him. He said, my question is about what you just read. Um, what in what I just read in terms of the question, are you referring to this question? I'm not getting your uh, your question very well. Is it about the question I read and the explanation that you said I should throw more light on? Is that what you are asking me? I want to get a clarification so that I can know how I can answer you uh, best in relation to that. So let's go to the next question. And the next question is about um, cash uh, receipt schedule. And it's the same question, but a B aspect of that question in relation to that. So let's see what we have there. It says, Yamiye Company Limited has forecasted its sales for the last three, for the last quarter of the financial year and December 31st as follows. So we have August, September, October, November, and December. For August and September, we are giving the actual sales as 90,000 and 140,000 respectively. So for August and September, the actual sales figure is 90,000 and 140,000 respectively. Then from October to November, we have 180,000, 200,000, and then 225,000 respectively. These are the sales forecast for October, November, and December. But listen to the language very well because remember what I told you. When it comes to the preparation of the cash budget, the language is very, very important. The statement is very, very important. And if you miss the English, you will be punished in relation to that. So we are told that Nyamiye has experienced cash collection from sales as 40% during the month of sales, 50% in the month after sales, and then 10% in the second month after sales. So this is the cash collection schedule for the company under consideration, Yamea Limited. So in the month of sales, they take 40%. One month after the sales, the following month, they take uh, 50%. And then the second month after sales, they take 10%. Very, very important. So this is the language you are going to be using to answer the question. The requirement of this question is to prepare a schedule of the expected cash receipts for the three months October through to December and determine the expected account receivable balance on 31st December. So we are supposed to look at the cash receipt schedule for October, November and December. Then on top of that, we are supposed to look out for the car, uh, the debtors or receivable balance at the end of 31st December. So let's look at how we go about it in relation to that. So Nyamiye Limited, remember the name of the uh, company always has to be written down. So Nyamiye Company Limited so we are working from August, September, October, November, December. So we are preparing the cash receipt schedule. That is what the examiner said we should do. The cash receipt schedule is how much cash is receivable based on the sales and based on the cost. So we bring the months respectively. So we're going to have August, September, October, November, December, I may want to bring January and maybe February because of the collection schedule of the organization. The currency we are using in this question is Ghana Cedis. All right, then the next thing is to bring the sales respectively. Remember for August and September, we were giving the actual sales as 90,000, 140,000. Then from October to December, we are giving the budgeted sales as 180,000, 200,000, and then two to 5,000. 
Right, so these are the sales respectively. So we underline them because we're not going to be needing them. Then we look at the collection. So there, there are three stages in the collection period. So we have the month of sale. And that's 40%. Then we have one month after sales or next month. That's 50%. Then we have the second month after sales. And that's 10%. So this is the collection uh, policy of the organization. So let me grab my calculator and you can grab your calculator as well. And then let's crunch this together. So let's see how we go about it. So August sales, 40% will be collected in August, 50% will be collected in September, and then 10% will be collected in October. Are you seeing this very well? And that is how we go about the schedule in relation to that. So 0.4 by 90, that's 36,000. And 50% will be received in September, that's 45,000. And then 10%, 9,000 will be received in uh, October. Now, remember, our focus is October to November. But we have to bring August and September so that we can get uh, the shadow in relation to that. So that is August. We are done. I like to go this diagonally. When I take each month, I work out it diagonally like that. And almost always, it's going to be diagonal like that in relation to that. Then for September, I'm going to have 40% of 140, and that's 56,000. And then 50% will come to the month of October, and that will be 17,000. And then 10% will go to November, and that will be 14,000. I hope you get a concept. So that is also for September sales. We are done. Then we go to October. 40% will be received in October, so 0.4 by 180, that's 72,000. Then 50% will be received in November, that's 90,000. And then 10% will be received in December, that's 18,000. So we are done also with the October sales. Then we go to the next one, November. November 40%, 0.4 of 200. That's 80,000. Then 50% will be received in December, and that will be 100,000. And then 10% will be received when? In January. So you see why I, bring, I brought the January there. So 10% will be received in January, and that will be 20,000. In January in relation to that so that is also about December's sales sorry November sales then let's go to the December sales 225 so 0.4 by 225 that's 90,000 will be received in December then 50% to be received in January okay so 125 50% that'll be 62 hey no I made a mistake <laughs> 225 that will be one one two five hundred. That will be received in January. Then ten percent will be received in the month of February, and that is twenty two thousand five hundred. I believe you get a schedule. So this is how we prepare the cash receipt schedule. So when you pick each month sales, you work it at it. You work at it using the collection schedule that has been given. Remember. This is one of the critical aspects when you are preparing the cash budget. And the examiner's statement that is made is what you have to follow. In some circumstances, the second month, that is the last shadow, is sometimes accounted for as bad debt. If it is accounted for as bad debt, that means we won't collect that money. So that money will not be included in the determination of the cash receipts from uh, our debtors. Now, from the requirements of the question, let me go back to my question. We are supposed to do October through to December. So we are interested in the October balance, November balance, and then the December balance. You could do this if you have the time to do that. So let me look at it from my workings real quick. And that, that's going to be 72 plus 70 plus 9. That's one five one thousand 
if I'm right, so you're going to punch your own as well. Then we're going to have 80 plus 90 plus 14. That's going to be 184,000. And then we're going to have 192,008,000. So this is the cash receipt uh, schedule that we are going to be taking to the cash budget under the receipt for October, November, and December. But remember this question is in twofold. We are supposed to do the cash receipt schedule for October through to December, as well as the receivable as at 30th December, 31st December uh, uh, of the year. So as at 30, 31st December, how much will be outstanding? How much will be outstanding is the money receivable in January and February. So we add these three figures up and that will become the receivables for the year ended. So when we add those figures up, we have the 112500. We have the 20,000 there. And then we have the 22500. And that is 155,000 and that will be the receivables as at the end of the year. So receivables, if you want trade receivables, and that's going to be 155,000 Ghana cities in relation to that. I believe you get a concept, you get a principle. So this is how we deal with the cash receipt schedule in relation to that. All right? The cash receipt schedule in relation to that. So you can put it down and let's uh, continue. Let me see if I have some questions here to look at real quick okay uh, okay what he said please there was a question that dropped in May 2013 and in relation to the cash budget for item 2 to 4 I think they are related to the computation of sales and purchases figures uh, okay that was the question you were asking but i think i just saw it then he said please throw a bit more light on them if not today maybe next class okay so i'm going to get uh that question uh may 2013 okay so let's take a screenshot of that so May 2013, so Boatin, I'm going to be looking at the question and then uh, maybe tomorrow possibly I may uh, look at it and then throw some light on it for you in relation to that. Okay. So that's our cash receipt schedule. If you have any questions about it, you can put it in the ch uh, chat box. Okay, so um Augustine said gracias okay oh uh, yeah so tomorrow god willing i'll look at it for you in relation to that so that's our cash receipt schedule for this uh question and uh i'll be running up for today here so uh tomorrow we will be continuing to conclude on this budgeting issue remember this topic is really on my heart because it's one of the fundamental areas in each management accounting question. So God willing, tomorrow we will look at uh, the third question here, which is on the labor budget. Uh, time may not permit me to cover that today. So we'll look at that tomorrow, uh, God willing. And then we will take uh, some full questions. So maybe I'll look at uh, the question from uh, Augustine. Maybe it will be helpful for everybody. So I will look at the May 2013 question and then from note 2 to note 4, 
I could uh, solve the workings here and explain them uh, for you tomorrow so that we can uh, uh, conclude on the issue about budgeting. Then I'm going to be giving you an assignment that you will try your hands on and then I'll come back again and come and do uh, uh, a discussion on it in relation to that so that you can build your understanding for rates in that case. So like I said, in case you need this question, you can send us a message on Skype. My Skype ID is Premium Educator. Or you can also send us a WhatsApp message that is plus 233-5011492-96. Plus 233-5011492-96 to request for the question and it will be sent to you in relation to that. So I will conclude here today for the class today. Thank you very much for joining the broadcast and remember to continue to share uh, the channel and uh, whatever questions you have, you make sure you put them down. If you are watching it live or you are watching uh, aftermath of it or the, uh, the review of the video, no P, just put the, your questions down and I'll be answering it. So some of Quaisin, uh, Augustine Yeboa, sorry, Augustine Boatin, Kamba, uh, Kambai, and then uh, Uje, Ije, uh, Uche Ijehu, and yeah. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining the broadcast today. It's a great pleasure serving you today. So tomorrow, same time, we, I'm going to come live, and we're going to conclude on this uh, cash budget, uh, the budgeting thing, probably tomorrow. I'm hoping that we can conclude. If not, we will see if we need to solve other questions as well in order for you to build your understanding well because the issue may not be necessarily about the pro forma but about the treatment of the footnotes like augustine just uh, mentioned of may 2013 you re realize that when you read the english the meaning of the english from a management accountant's perspective is where the challenge is and i'm going to be going through a number of questions with you so that we can build a solid understanding of this just like how we've built a solid understanding of it in relation to that so i see uh a next another question from kamba kambai please at what time class commence or uh, 4 p.m uh kamba so 4 p.m uh or 1600 gmt 4 p.m ghana time or 1600 gmt uh, i don't know your country and your time zone so 1600 gmt sometimes if it is not 1600 it could jump to 1630 gmt so 1600 or 1630 gmt so by 1600 gmt you have to uh stay alert or come to the channel and i may start at we may start at uh 1600 or sometimes 1630 gmt in relation to that as well so that is it so subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell as well so that if i go live you'll be notified and you can uh join the stream and i can help you to answer any questions that you are having so thank you very much for joining the broadcast continue to support the work that we do and share the video as well we want to reach as much people as possible and be able to touch as much as much uh, as much students as possible right so make that possible for us by sharing the video and sharing it as well with your colleagues and your friends thank you very much and i will see you god willing same time tomorrow all right kamba said thanks so much for your time it's a pleasure always to serve you so you take care of yourself and remember i believe that almost everyone watching me uh is some way in a quarantine because of the coronavirus pandemic um new york ghana nigeria some amount of lockdown south africa sierra leone uh uh uk some amount of lockdown but hey take the time not to be thinking about the lockdown don't be fearful about it just refocus yourself, repurpose yourself, and look at what you can do to add value to your life and to take your life to the next level. Because after this pandemic, life has to go on. In this pandemic, life has to go on. So don't spend your time meditating or focusing on what is happening. Just stay safe. Uh, be careful of yourself. Don't flaunt the uh, uh, breakdown or lockdown rules. Stay at home. If you are going out, go out with a legitimate purpose. Wear your nose masks. Uh, put on your gloves or your uh, hand sanitizers and wash
wash your hands regularly so you stay safe and you stay alert uh, as uh, out of the any infection in relation to that but i believe that you shouldn't be full of fear you shouldn't be looking at the news and be scared about it rather look at the positive aspect look at how you can add value to your life look at how you can take your life to the next level because at the end of the day like i mentioned life has to go on with coronavirus or without coronavirus so the big question is how will your life be after the coronavirus if you want your life to be bigger better and greater then start thinking about this and start spending time to improve yourself and take your life to the next level thank you very much for joining the broadcast and i'll see you same time tomorrow as we continue with our journey on the uh, discussions that we are doing to assist you in this period of quarantine so you prepare well for your acca your sema your cpa or whatever examination that you are writing so you can prepare well and pass your examination thank you i love you and stay blessed.